Have you ever wanted to make a realistic space shuttle in Kerbal Space Program 2? Well, if you have, then you've come to the right place. Because in today's video, I'm going to be demonstrating just that. We're going to start in the VAB, where I'll show you how to build the shuttle. Then we're going to take it out to the launch pad for a quick orbital test flight. All right, let's get straight into it. So the first thing you want to go ahead and do is grab the space shuttle style cockpit, followed by placing a small nose cone on the front leg. So then we go over to the payload section and grab a large cargo bay that can be put on the back of the cockpit. Afterward, we're going to go to the fuel tank section and look for the large Mark III type Methalox tank. And then we can go ahead and put our engine adapter and then engines. So we're going to grab three vectors. Each of them are going to be put onto the nodes. And then after you do that, you're going to pop open the rotate tool. And this step is pretty important. You want to rotate each of them one kind of snap upward. And that's about 15 degrees, I'm pretty sure. So 15 degrees up. And this is going to give you a lot of extra stability during the initial launch. Because the, the you know, if you know space shuttle, the thrust is very offset from the center of mass. So we need to add a little bit extra gimbling authority in that one axis to help help it stay, you know, upright during the launch. Uh, next bit is pretty important, arguably the most important part of any space shuttle build, and that is the wings. And especially with the new KSP-2 wing segment modification procedural wing type thing, it can be pretty difficult to get the wings right. And, you know, if you're Matt Lown, you make something like this, and, oh, I love you, Matt, but e, that's kind of rough. That's not great. So let's see if we can improve on that a little bit. So you can use my design. I'll read you off my values in a second here. You can also look at them on the screen. But feel free to change it up a little bit, try and optimize it. I mean, I think mine looks pretty good but I'm sure someone out there could do something better. So if you're interested in knowing my value, so it's it's the wingspan 0.15, wing angle 0.33, root length 0.44, root thickness 0.05, tip length 0.08, tip thickness 0.02, tip angle 0.5. Now for the control surface, the span is 1.0, length 0.06, and the position is zero. So like I said, those are my values. You can use them if you want. Feel free to not, you know, feel free to try and improve the design. So Next thing we're going to do is grab the wing strake, and if you see in the real space shuttle, the wing kind of curves and then goes inward a little bit, and that is what we're trying to make right now. Now, something important to keep in mind, this thing is quite back heavy because you have the fuel tank and the engines all the way in the back there, so you have to be very careful to make sure that your center of lift does not go in front of your center of mass because we all know what happens. Well, maybe you don't. If you don't know what happens, in planes, if you are back heavy, you tend to flip out. You tend to die. So if you would like to land upright, we're going to try and make sure the center of lift is behind the center of mass. So you can make the wing strike bigger than I have done here. And if you do that, you just be careful, right? Because if you're making it too big, you're moving the center of lift forward. And if it just gets in front of that center of mass, you know, whoop, 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 kaboom. Um, so just keep that in mind. You can make it a little bit bigger than I have shown here. My, I do have a little bit of margin, but um, that's just, like I said, something to keep in mind. So now I'm grabbing a little structural panel, and that's going to be the little kind of back Elevon type looking aerodynamic cover, if you will, for the engines. And I would say uh, another quick thing to note here is you probably should have an image of the space shuttle as reference, even if you're following this tutorial one to one. Just have something as reference because, you know, sometimes it's hard to judge like how wide something should be, like the wings or the you know, exact engine placement and how long, stuff like that. I mean, like I said, even if you are following the tutorial, like you know, frame by frame, even part by part, it still may be useful just to get a kind of kind of general graph, just to double check your thing is actually looking right. And thing, speaking of looking right, important to get the vertical stabilizer to look right. It's probably a little bit bigger than you'd think, actually. Like you can actually go back and use my values again, like I said. But pretty important because it's you know it's a big piece. It, it, the look it adds to the look of the craft. And another thing that adds to the look of the craft, speaking of epic transitions, is the little OLM pods, the Orbital Maneuvering Thrusters. Did I say OLM? That's not the right acronym. But um, these little pods, it might actually be the right of them. These little pods are, are pretty tough. I haven't figured out an amazing way to do them yet, but what I have right now is these little kind of space plane fuel tank parts followed by a small nose pin on the front. And you could obviously do something way more complicated. Uh, I did use a Terrier engine, by the way. You could do something way more complicated with fairings and all that fun stuff, but another aspect of the build I wanted to focus on was the part count. Now, as we all know, KSP-2 struggles with performance. It really struggles. So I'm trying to keep the parts to an absolute minimum for this build. So it is a little bit, a little bit simple especially in that back but i think it looks pretty good if you kind of rotate and clip them i think it honestly looks pretty acceptable so next we're going to do is add the monoprop fuel tank and very important you put that at the front put this at the front because 
this tank is really serving two purposes. One is to give a whole bunch of fuel to the, the monoprop, the RCS thrusters, which helps a lot for the orbital thrusters because you, you know, those two little terrier engines at the top that you use for orbital maneuvering, they're, as you can see, at the top. So the center of thrust and center of mass are not very aligned when you're in orbit. So you need those thrusters to help keep you going in the right direction. So you need a lot of fuel for those, important. Now the other arguably more important role that they serve is they add weight to the front. And that helps, like I said, keep the center of mass in front of the center lift and keep the shuttle upright during landing. Very important. Now we're doing the landing gear and this is a little bit of an interpretation. I think it'd be fine to either use the medium or large landing gear. The medium look closer to what the shuttle landing gear is, but they are too, they're too small as you can see. Way too small. The shuttle landing gear are quite a bit bigger. It looks almost like kind of like a weird like baby legs when you're coming into land. But you know, up to you, I think this does look a little bit better just because it's more accurate to the, to the shape of the wheels, but um, you know, up to you. Next thing is gonna grab the big boy, the new decoupler and the Mark V or five meter or extra large fuel tank. I think it's called in KSP2. I still use my old KSP1 language here. It's the, the lar extra large fuel tank. We're gonna grab the really big one and then we're gonna grab a small one, a small extra large. It's kind of an extra one, but a small extra large after you put the big one. And this is obviously the orange tank, the big boy, the big tank. And this thing may not be quite as big as you think. And another thing, it's also a little bit higher than you probably think on the stack. So the, the orange tank actually ends before the space, before the end of the space shuttle, and it goes way above the space shuttle. So just keep that in mind. Next thing is, is get to the fairings. Um, and you could use like a, like a aerodynamic nose cone or something as this back, but I think using a fairing looks a little better, a little more realistic. And, you know, to be honest, even though at, at first I didn't like the fairing kind of menu thing, the way to build fairings, I actually way prefer it over KSP-1. It is, it is very nice. So after you put the orange tank on like so, you can, you can just add the little nose cone. The, this nose cone actually looks pretty good. I think it's actually almost designed to, to be the shuttle orange tank. You know, after that, it's the, the SRBs, and this really can kind of almost complete the look of the, of the shuttle. And another thing, while the orange tank is maybe a little bit higher than it, it may, most people may think, the, the uh, boosters are lower than you may think. So the bells extend, important, the bells extend beyond the aft of the space shuttle. They extend actually quite a bit after the space shuttle. And, you know, this is important to get the looks right, but also important to keep your stability right, because it is designed like this for a reason. You have to keep the weight distributed evenly so you don't flip over. And it's very easy to flip over the space shuttle. It's very tricky. Now, like I said, you also can use the nose cone. This is continuing on with nose cone versus fairing theme, but you can use a nose cone for the, these Clydesdale type SRBs. But I like to do a fairing better because it's, it's very triangular. The uh, the boosters in real life and the nose cone doesn't really look accurate in my opinion. So next up is the fun part. It's the painting part. And I like it. Actually, I really like this kind of glossy metal look for the shuttle and booster. So I honestly, I just went with that. Feel free to obviously color whatever you want. And then I just did orange for the booster. And I think this looks actually oh, pretty sweet, to be honest. So, you know, you can make a blue, green, yellow, pink, whatever color you want. Who am I to judge? But this is, I think, what looks, what looks the best. This kind of glossy metallic kind of exposed looking thing. And, you know, that's what, we're, that's what I went with. And I was just kept the orange tank orange. Now we're gonna go ahead and make it vertical and rotate it. Make it important to rotate because if you don't rotate the, the stack, you're gonna be launching directly toward the launch tower and the, the shuttle, as most of you probably know, it kind of does a little bit of a power slide after it lifts off. So you will be power sliding straight into the launch tower and exploding. So important to rotate. And another important thing is the launch clamps. You need launch clamps, but you also have to remember, because of that power side, it's gonna be sliding in toward the booster, basically. If you're looking at that booster, it's gonna be sliding in the direction of the booster. So make sure all of your launch clamps are facing away from the booster. You know what, if you, you know what I mean? Because you don't want your thing to launch and then your, your rocket is kind of slide into the launch clamps and then tip over and crash. So always keep all of your launch clamps, as you see I have here, behind that orange tank, behind it, and make sure you have enough wing clearance that the wings can make it past the, the clamps as well. Now, next thing, struts. Because of the wobbly Kraken type things in KSP2, we need a lot of them. Strut the whole thing up. And there's a good chance when you first hit launch, the rocket's just gonna fall apart on the, on the, on the stand. Now, what you do in that scenario is A, you could add more launch clamps, but B, and this is probably the best course of action, just more struts. Strut, 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 strut. And sometimes you just have to revert to launch. Right, you, you launch, it falls apart, hit revert, and then sometimes it works. This thing is very, in a little bit of a dubious condition at the moment, KSP2. So if your thing falls apart, struts, launch clamps, revert. That's, that's your best course of action. 
Now, next thing is a separate challenge for the boosters. Go ahead and add those on. And I know it's adding park count, which is I really, I want to try to do this without separate challenges at first, but you do kind of need them. And I am going to make a video about KSP2 performance in, in the nearish future because I think I'm starting to, we're starting to get a little bit of a grasp on what's going on here. But we are just about done with the construction of our space shuttle here. So we're going to be crossfading over to the launch in about 10 or so seconds. By the way, if you do want to copy my stage setup, which you, you may want to, feel free to just look at what I have over on the pad because that is going to be the, the final design. So without further ado, let's get this thing launched. So here we are out on the pad. And the first thing we're going to do is fire up our three vector engines. And when that happens, you're going to want to hold down the S key, keep the nose up, up, up. Here come the boosters. Here come the launch cams. And we have liftoff. Expect it to be a little bit slow off the pad, and then after a few seconds, it should actually speed up. And the lag may not be as bad as you expect, but it is still kind of rough. Now, if you haven't flown a space shuttle before, neither KSP-1 or even KSP-2 yet, expect it to be a little bit tough to control. It's going to be a little bit demanding, probably one of the harder rockets you've ever flown because of, of the thrust issues. It's going to be yawing and pitching and rolling, but after a few attempts, you should get used to it. And if you have flown shuttles in KSP-1, you'll, you'll be delighted to know I think they're a little bit easier in KSP-2. So that's nice. But uh, we are getting close to the end of the, the booster burn here, and when that happens, I'd actually recommend separating the SRVs, and they have about 10 meters a second of Delta D, and there you get like I'm showing here, and you'll see they they run out a few right as they exit the right as they exit the frame, and that just helps a little bit so they don't accidentally run into the wings. And even with the separate trans, I was encountering that issue, but now that the boosters are gone, expect the thing to be very very slow. And because of that, I'm holding a pretty steep ascent profile. Like you see, I'm holding between 30 to 40 degrees for most of this most of this uh, just vector burn. And I would recommend doing that so you don't fall back down to curb it. Also, keep in mind, because of the center of this, this applies to the entire ascent of the shuttle. Any roll input you make is also going to induce a yaw. So anytime you hit QRE, you're also going to need to compensate with a little bit of A and D and vice versa. Just keep that in mind as well if you haven't flown shuttle before. But we are just about at orbital velocity here. I'm going to go ahead and chop the vector engines in one second. There we go. And then it's going to be time to separate the orange tank, turn off the vectors, and then turn on our orbital maneuvering engines. And again, we have more center of thrust issues. This is kind of the theme of space shuttles is the center of thrust is never really a sign of the center, aligned with the center of mass. So that's how we have the RCS thrust and the um, control wheels or reaction wheels rather and even at 100% thrust actually that's it's not gonna work it's still gonna flip as you can see you can obviously do a little bit of exploit by just increasing the time up right as you hit 100% throttle but if you want to keep it straight at uh, at one time speed 50% throttle the RCS thrusters thrusters and reaction wheels will actually be able to compensate so half thrust should be good but once you're in orbit what do we have to do we have to exit orbit so once you found a, a satisfactory d over point and that's kind of your own judgment where you want it where you want to start that burn you want to light up those engines and get the thing pointing towards the ksc or wherever your designated landing spot is now with the lacking of heating in ksp2 early access right now it's a little bit easier a little bit less one less variable to worry about so i'm just kind of going straight down towards the atmosphere and right around the 50-ish kilometer 60-ish kilometer point what i'm going to do is actually Instead of pointing uh, prograde, just hit the SAS stability lock mode. And what that's going to do is as the kind of planet starts falling away, the curvature of, well, no, what am I talking about? Curbin's flat. But okay, anyway, it, jokes aside, but as the curvature falls away, as the planet kind of falls away, that's going to cause the pitch to kind of rise on its own just automatically. And that's going to add a nice amount of drag and also lift to your, uh, your descent. And that's going to allow, as you can see, we kind of, we're not really descending. We're just holding our altitude. And we did actually climb for a little bit. And that, so that kind of helps extend your glide. And if we had heating, that would help with heating as well. But uh, we are going to start, we do have that pretty high angle of attack. So we are going to start hitting the air and slowing down. And if we continue comparing to KSP-1, I'd say this descent and just aero in general is, is quite a bit better in KSP-2. So this, that was a nice, I'm not happy to see that, right? Because space shuttles, they have a tendency to be very unstable in KSP-1. So it was nice that we just went straight in, straight towards the runway. And we even, we came in really fast in the atmosphere. Did a nice job slowing us down. But uh, once you get over the runway, just a pretty, pretty standard landing. I kind of do a little bit of a float here you'll see in a second. And we kind of float over the runway for quite a bit because they did come in a little bit fast, but the runways in KSP2 are very, very, very long. So feel free to float out for as long as you would like. 
And I just want to just do that to bleed speed so we can touch down in a nice, slow, controlled manner. You don't want to be bouncing or flipping or spinning. So just nice to touch down at a very slow speed. So dropping it down to one time of speed here. And here we are coming in for a nice little landing. And then touchdown. Welcome back to Kerbin. I'm going to pop open the parachute. And ooh, parachutes look good in KSP2. Once that happens, you can start hitting the B key if you want it to slow down with the brakes. And then just bring the shuttle to a stop. Like I said, big run race. So you shouldn't really have to worry about overrunning. But uh, that is going to bring us to the end of today's shuttle tutorial. I hope you enjoyed.